Please note that filming text on the whiteboard requires extremely bright studio lighting. Subsequently, sunglasses were worn during the filming of this video to prevent damage to my retinas. A note on how to use these sessions. Jot down the notes as we go, so we'll help you learn the material in a more interactive way, and you can use them as study notes later. Also, in the small chance that the discrepancy arises between the professor's notes and mine, always go with your professor. They're the one grading you. Lastly, any examples or analogies used in this session are not meant to support or criticize politics, religion, or lifestyle. They're merely learning tools to help understand the material. All right, guys and girls, it's time to get cracking. Okay, so you guys have already learned about alkanes, single bonds, alkenes, double bonds. Now it's finally time to learn about alkynes, triple bonds. So let's start off by talking about general information about these guys so we can get acquainted with alkynes. Then we'll move on to how you make alkynes and we'll finish by talking about the types of reactions that alkynes will undergo. There are two main categories of reactions that alkynes will undergo. The first is converting an alkyne to a nucleophile. This is making these alkynes, these triple bonds, into nucleophiles so they can do SN2 reactions. Okay, so very cool reactions because they're gonna allow us to make carbon-carbon bonds for the very first time. And anytime you can make carbon-carbon bonds in chemistry, this is a huge deal. Okay, so first type of reaction that alkynes will undergo is converting these to nucleophiles so they can do SN2 reactions. The second type of reaction that alkynes will undergo are called electrophilic additions. Hopefully this sounds very familiar to you though. If you remember your alkene chemistry, alkenes, double bonds, underwent electrophilic additions. You learned a bunch of electrophilic additions for alkenes. Alkynes have five of these electrophilic additions in common with alkenes. So if you remember your alkenes chemistry, this should be a piece of cake. Almost identical reactions with a few slight tweaks, okay? So let's go ahead and jump into the general information about alkynes. Okay, so what does an alkyne look like? Well, an alkyne is a carbon-carbon triple bond. Let me go ahead and draw one of these up here. Okay, so you're gonna have a carbon that's connected to another carbon by a triple bond. But when you draw these triple bonds, do it like this where the carbon and the carbon are stuck together by one single bond in black and draw the other two bonds in blue. And the reason I want you to do this is because I want you to be able to distinguish that a carbon-carbon triple bond isn't just three single bonds put together. This is actually one single bond connecting these carbons with two multiple bonds on top of that single bond. Another way of saying this is that a carbon-carbon triple bond consists of one sigma bond, which you see in black, and two pi bonds, which you see in blue. Okay, so the one you see in black is a single bond, this blue one is a pi bond, and this blue one is a pi bond also. So, go ahead and write this down, that a triple bond, This isn't just three single bonds put together. This is one single sigma bond. Okay, so go ahead and write that. You have one sigma bond, which you see in black right here, plus two pi bonds, which you see in blue. And remember that sigma single bonds, these are formed by overlapping hybridized orbitals. Whereas pi bonds, multiple bonds, are formed by overlapping unhybridized pure p orbitals. Okay, so sigma single bonds, these are the bonds that first connect atoms together. Multiple bonds go on top of those single bonds, and these are formed by overlapping pure p orbitals. Okay, so let me show you what I mean in respect to our carbon-carbon triple bonds. So we've got a carbon that's connected to another carbon. These two carbons are first bonded together by a single sigma bond formed by overlapping hybridized orbitals, okay? So that's where the first sigma bond comes in. And then you have two pi, two multiple bonds that go on top of this single bond. And these pi bonds are formed by overlapping pure p orbitals, okay? So each one of these carbons has two p orbitals and they are pure unhybridized p orbitals. Let me go ahead and draw out one of these orbitals for this carbon. Okay, so the p orbital consists of a top half and a bottom half. This isn't two p orbitals, this is one p orbital, a top and a bottom half. This carbon is gonna have two of these. 
this carbon is also going to have two of these. I'm only going to draw out one of the p orbitals so far for each of these carbons. I'll draw out the other one in just a second. What I want you to see here is that these carbons are first connected by a single sigma bond, and then any bonds on top of that are formed by overlapping pure p orbitals, such as this, such as this. Okay, so when these pure p orbitals overlap, this is going to form one multiple bond. Okay, so if you looked at your carbon-carbon triple bond, here's your single bond, here's your single bond. These p orbitals that are overlapping right now, this is going to give you one multiple bond. But hey, I told you that each one of these carbons has two pure unhybridized p orbitals. This was only one of them. This was only one of them. Let me draw the other one that each one of these has. And when these pure p orbitals overlap, this is going to give you your other multiple bond, okay? So in green right now, this is the other pure p orbital that each of these carbons have, and this is going to give you your other multiple bond, forming your triple bond. And this is why a triple bond consists of one sigma single bond in black and two pi bonds, which you see formed by these overlapping unhybridized pure p orbitals, okay? So this carbon has one p orbital here in blue and one p orbital here in green. And this carbon also has one pure p orbital in blue and one in green here. So this in green from this carbon and this carbon will overlap to form one multiple bond. And in blue, you see these overlapping to form another multiple bond, giving you three bonds here total, one sigma bond and two pi bonds, all right? Oh, and if these triple bonds look a little bit incomplete to you, it should, because there should obviously be another atom coming off of this carbon, like a hydrogen here, for example, and another one coming off of this one. And you could just put hydrogens there, for example. This would be the simplest alkyne you can get. This is known as acetylene, okay? So if you want to draw it in here, you can also. These are single sigma bonds formed by overlapping hybridized orbitals, okay? So this is just the simplest alkyne possible known as acetylene. It's just a triple bond with hydrogens on both sides. Okay, so why do I not want you to think of a triple bond as just being three single bonds put together? Why do I want you to understand that a triple bond is actually a sigma bond plus two pi bonds, plus two multiple bonds? Well, the reason why I don't want you to think of this as three single bonds put together is because single bonds, sigma bonds, these are very strong, hard to break bonds. It's very difficult to do reactions with sigma single bonds. However, multiple bonds like pi bonds, these can be broken. You've seen pi bonds be broken before. Remember in alkene addition reactions? You had an alkene, it had a double bond, one multiple bond that formed by an overlap of pure p orbitals. This pi bond is what broke to do your electrophilic additions, right? You guys, if you remember, we added things in here such as HBr. And this did an electrophilic addition reaction to this alkene because this alkene broke the pi bond to come and pick up this hydrogen, kick off the bromine. And it broke this pi bond, this bond that's formed by overlapping pure p orbitals. This pi bond is not as strong of a bond as, a, say, a sigma single bond, okay? So I want you to understand that in a triple bond, you have a sigma bond that's very, very difficult to break, and you have two pi bonds that can be broken. You've already seen pi bonds be broken in addition reactions for alkenes. If alkenes had one pi bond that could be broken to do one addition reaction, how many addition reactions do you think a triple bond can do that has two pi bonds that can be broken? Well, if a triple bond has two pi bonds that can be broken, it's going to be able to do two addition reactions, okay? So where an alkene just had one pi bond to do one addition reaction, alkynes have one, two pi bonds that can do two addition reactions. And you're going to find out all about this a little bit later when we go over the reactions that alkynes undergo, okay?
Okay, so it's important to understand that a triple bond has two pi bonds because those two pi bonds can be broken to do two consecutive electrophilic additions.